on the organization and management of the Internal Revenue Service. Wednesday's witnesses included IRS Commissioner Charles Rosati and representatives from the Government Accounting Office and National Academy of Public Administration. This hearing lasts two hours and 35 minutes. Subcommittee on Government Management, uh, Information and Technology will come to order. Uh, each year on this day, April 15th, the Internal Revenue Service holds individuals accountable for the accurate reporting of their tax liability. It is fitting that today we hold the IRS accountable as well. In past years, this subcommittee has held similar hearings and heard reports of mismanagement at the IRS, ranging from its inability to provide reliable financial information to poor debt collection practices. I am pleased that the IRS has made great progress, allowing its auditors, auditors to render for the first time a clean opinion on its financial statements. We know that a lot more remains to be done. Today we will discuss with Commissioner Rosati his plans to revamp the Internal Revenue Service organizational structure. We will review the results of the most recent financial audit with the General Accounting Office. In addition, we will hear from several witnesses that represent taxpayers on their views on improving the Internal Revenue Service's management. And it's a pleasure to welcome Commissioner Rosati in his first appearance before this subcommittee. Last year, uh, I wrote the President and asked Ms. Maloney, the then ranking Democrat, to join me in that. And we said, Mr. President, in essence, We've had some wonderful tax accountants. We've had some wonderful tax lawyers. Why don't you get somebody that has run an organization and been an executive? And I must say, I'm delighted with the President's choice, Secretary Rubin's choice. They made an outstanding selection in the gentleman that we have before us. I'd like to defer to my colleague, Tom Davis of Virginia, who will introduce Commissioner Rosati, whom he's known for a number of years. Gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, Charles and I talked about this before he took the job on. He's been uh, his company, AMS, of which he uh, co-founded. He was chairman of the board and CEO uh, prior to being named head of uh, the Internal Revenue Service. He's a graduate of Georgetown University and uh, has a uh, MBA from, from Harvard. And he was a former Pentagon whiz kid. But most of all, with his company, AMS, which is headquartered in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, he understands information technology. He understands the changing role of technology. And he understands how you treat customers which is something the IRS has uh, not had a great historic uh, uh, anything that they can brag about. Uh, I have read his testimony today. I'm very impressed with the direction that the service is going at this point. And I think the, uh, sometimes there comes a man for the times when it's a difficult time, a transitional time. This is what it is for the Internal Revenue Service. And I think uh, not only with Mr. Rosati's business background and his success there, his understandings of information technology and its changing roles as we deal with the computer systems at IRS, uh, Y2K problem and other priorities, uh, his understanding of the needs of the customer, but most of all his integrity that he has shown uh, with a long distinguished career in business and has been universally regarded as a, as a pillar of integrity in the business. Uh, this is the man to lead the IRS at a very difficult time. So I'm very proud to have him as a corporate constituent in Fairfax, even though he technically lives in the District of Columbia. Uh, and we're proud of the job he is doing and look forward to hearing from him today. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Commissioner, we have a routine in subcommittees of government reform and oversight. If you and Mr. Music will stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The clerk will note that both gentlemen have affirmed the oath. That I had to swear to the IRS yesterday as I signed my return, <laughs> so it's kind of turnabout here. Gee, I'm surprised by that reaction. Uh, Commissioner, it's all yours. We're delighted to have you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Congressman Davis, thank you for, for that introduction. I, every time I hear these kind words, it makes me lose even more sleep because I worry if I can live up to this. But uh, we'll, we hope two years from now, after the turn of the year 2000, that we'll still be back here and uh, beginning, beginning uh, those kind of comments. Um, and I do welcome the opportunity to testify and also uh, uh, with respect to the GAO audit of our 1997 custodial financial statements. Um, since I became commissioner, I have tried to make clear uh, my priorities for the IRS, which are to shift the entire focus of the agency 
from one which focuses solely on conducting our own internal operations to one which puts far more emphasis on trying to see things from the point of view of taxpayers and emphasizing service and fairness to taxpayers. And I would like to just very briefly lay out first my concept of how we, uh, I think, have to go about modernizing the IRS in order to achieve these kinds of goals. Uh, let me say, though, at the outset that uh, the restructuring legislation, which is currently uh, before the Senate, is, is extremely important to our ability to carry out some of the changes that I think we need to do, and in particular, some of the increased flexibility in the personnel area. Uh, I think that one of the important things that I'm going to mention that we need to do is to streamline the roles and responsibilities of managers in the IRS, and we're going to have to, I think, enrich the, the existing internal executive group with some selective hiring from the outside, and the legislation will be very important enabling us to do that. Um, I have outlined, I think, five basic areas that I think we need to modernize the IRS in, and I think all five of them uh, go together and are important. The first one is to really rethink all of the business practices uh, that we conduct at the IRS so that we can shift the focus towards understanding, solving, and in many cases preventing taxpayer problems much earlier in the cycle so they don't get far downstream and that cause uh, severe uh, problems for taxpayers uh, very late in the process. Part of this is to look at the particular problems of particular groups of taxpayers that have common needs. Uh, it's a big country. There's a lot of different kinds of taxpayers. And if you look at college students, senior citizens, small businesses, they're very, very different. And we need to uh, tailor our practices to serve each, each kind of customer. Secondly, we do need to rethink the organization structure so that we can have uh, clearer responsibility for serving each of these segments of taxpayers. And uh, I think one of the things that we need to do there is to reorganize so that the, each unit has end-to-end, -end, as I call it, full responsibility for serving a se segment of taxpayers, such as small businesses. The third thing is we do need to streamline internally and to create fewer layers of management and to define management roles with much more clear responsibility and accountability. The fourth area is in measuring organizational performance so that we get <coughs> what we really want uh, and we measure what we really want. And this requires balancing customer satisfaction, business results, employee satisfaction, and productivity. It's important that our employees be measured by what we actually want them to do, and a big part of that is serving taxpayers uh, helpfully and productively. And of course, the fifth and really huge area is technology. IRS's current computer systems simply cannot support the agency's mission and goals. Uh, we, we, we really very much need to upgrade our 20- and 30-year-old computer systems. Uh, building systems, of course, to support the old business practices and the old organization will not work either. So the, uh, the, the organizational changes and the technology changes go hand in hand. I'm pleased to say that the recently issued technology modernization blueprint uh, and some of the changes that have been made within the CIO organization, I think, do provide the beginning of a basis for managing uh, our new technology. Mr. Chairman, we have engaged a consulting firm of Booz Allen and Hamilton to help us validate uh, these changes, uh, especially the organizational changes, and to define more de in more detail the risks, the cost, and the impact. And we will be reporting in more detail when that study is complete, hopefully this summer. Uh, I think that the restructuring legislation and the changes that I have proposed to, to make it work uh, provide a compelling case that the uh, President's FY99 budget, uh, as requested, be approved. Uh, this will enable us to make a start on improving customer service and technology, as well as provide uh, an initial $25 million to begin the modernization of the organization. And of course, Mr. Chairman, before any of these improvements can really be realized, we must and we absolutely must deal successfully with uh, the century date change problem uh, so that our computer systems can continue to operate successfully after the turn of the century. Now, let me just turn briefly to the financial audit. Uh, I'm very pleased to say uh, that, and, and I must say that not with any, any help from me because I was not even here uh, for most of the time when this work was done. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm very happy about it that, uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, that the IRS did receive from GAO an unqualified opinion on the 1997 fiscal year custodial financial statements. I'm also pleased to report that the Treasury Inspector General gave a similar clean opinion on the 1997 administrative financial statements. Um, I think that uh, uh, this success does reflect the commitment of the organization to Congress 
uh, and specifically this subcommittee to improve financial management in the IRS and to hold ourselves to the same standards uh, as are expected of taxpayers. As GAO has indicated, however, and I must say I agree with this, this excellent result was achieved because of a very special effort on the part of the IRS financial staff and operating staff, not because we have the basic systems that we need to really support modern financial management in our tax system. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we do need to improve our, and, and fall through on the modernization blueprint. Um, I will confine myself to those general comments, Mr. Chairman, on the financial statements because I have had to recuse myself uh, from detailed involvement with this matter because of a potential conflict of interest with my former company. So I will leave uh, my colleague, Mr. Music here, who's actually the one who did all the work anyhow, uh, to, to uh, comment further on the financial statement matter. In conclusion, let me just say that although budget dollars are essential, uh, that money alone is not going to solve the problems of the IRS, we're going to follow, have to follow through on a comprehensive modernization plan which includes organizational and technological modernization, uh, as I've indicated. Uh, I do believe, though, that there is a new day at the IRS in the sense that we are opening a new, ch a new, uh, a new part of the history of the or organization, and each day we push forward the process of change a little further. The restructuring legislation and the other support that we're getting from Congress will very much help us with this. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we thank you. And now, Mr. Music, if you can summarize your statement, we'll then open it for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rosati covered a number of points that I won't, but I think it's important to reiterate that this is the first time that the organization has received a clean opinion or an unqualified opinion from both the Inspector General and the General Accounting Office. On both our statements, we do have two sets of statements, one administrative, which controls our appropriated funds, and the other, which controls our custodial funds, and that's the tax revenues we collect. However, I would also like to add to what Mr. Rosati said, that receiving an unqualified opinion does not resolve some of the serious technology problems related to tax systems. These problems need to be thoroughly addressed if we are to continue making critical, important financial management inroads. There were two weaknesses that the GAO identified that I think uh, need to be highlighted. As the GAO indicated in the, its audit report, the IRS general ledger does not support the preparation of custodial financial statements, and the revenue systems lack a subsidiary ledger for unpaid assessments. What this means is that the IRS will have to continue to extract detailed data from the taxpayer master file and reconcile it to its old accounting system so that the auditors can continue to express an opinion on the reliability of the numbers. This is not the most effective or efficient way to develop financial statements for such a lar large organization, but given the existing technology, I'm not aware of another choice. I'd also like to point out that this problem does not exist with the administrative systems. Over the last few years, we have implemented a corporate financial system, eliminating eight standalone accounting systems, and by the end of this October, it will be year 2000 compliant. So we feel very comfortable on the administrative side that we can continue the success. I believe that the clean opinions given by the GAO and the Inspector General does not mean that the IRS financial management objectives have been accomplished, but they are just beginning. The problems we have been addressing took years to occur. Therefore, they can't be fixed quickly or overnight. However, I do believe that management attention and resources are being applied to build upon the current results and that financial management in the IRS will be a model in government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This concludes my remarks. Well, we thank you. Uh, we will now start the questioning. There will be 10 minutes alternating between uh, each side. Uh, the gentleman can be with us, can you, for the next half hour? Uh, about 15 minutes. Okay. We'll get there. Let me start, Commissioner, with a couple of broad policy questions. Uh, one that interests me is the collection strategy. I've noticed with interest that you have, uh, and GAO, the General Accounting Office, also has fairly good analysis of what is the possible write-off, what is possibly collectible, so forth. Could you tell us a little bit how you feel uh, where we are with the IRS in collecting the money in a timely way so that the rest of us that pay our taxes don't have to be making up for the defaulters and the deadbeats? So what kind of strategy do you have in mind? Well, uh, what, what Mr. Music said about the way that he was able to 
uh, get a clean opinion on the financial statements, the custodial financial statements, which was essentially by, uh, you know, being very ingenious in working with some old systems and figuring out a way to, to get around the limitations of these and ultimately get a result which, which GAO felt was reliable, but which was really not an appropriate long-term way to do business. I would say that is almost, I would say the same thing about the way that we collect money. Uh, there is very great opportunity within the IRS using emulation of practices in the private sector, I think, to collect money. And now here I'm talking about collecting money where the debt is already established, not the question of uh, examination of returns or, or examination of potential issues about how much tax liability there is. I'm saying it, given that there's a tax liability established, uh, the, the, the amount of collecting it. Um, the, 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 the most basic and most important observation that I have, I think, come across since I've been at the IRS is just simply the age of the receivables that we collect. In other words, if you look at all the collection activity that the IRS does with its phone collectors and its field collectors, 90 percent of that effort is applied to uh, accounts that are more than six months old, and many of them are many years old. Uh, that's the reverse of what anybody in the private sector would do. I mean, they would put all the effort on finding out where the risks are up front and getting into those quickly as possible, and then only only, uh, you know, as sort of a specialized kind of an effort would be applied downstream. Um, now, why is that? Well, that gets to the basic questions of, it's, it's, it's very analogous to the thing about the financial statements. It's not a simple problem to fix because it's embedded in the organization structure, the business practices, in some cases regulations, and most importantly, the computer technology. I mean, if you look at the IRS collection apparatus, broadly speaking, there are three different kinds of collection operations. Uh, each with its own different computer system and its own database spread over 43 different operational units. And each of those is charged with collecting from every kind of taxpayer, from small to big, you know, over every time frame, not over every time frame, but over every kind of taxpayer. Uh, and, um, and it's possible that any one taxpayer could, could be involved with at least three or four of these different units. Uh, now, it, it isn't because some, some evil, evil person sat down and said, let's design you know, a, a, an overly complex system. It just evolved like Topsy over 45 years, and, and each place was put in. Uh, I think there are some improvements we can make short term, which we're attempting to do, but I think that the real answer here lies <laughs> in modernizing and rethinking the whole thing, and really just trying to do it in a way that is more similar to what the private well, world does. On, on that point, let me ask you, what is your perception at this point of what the IRS should do and what private collectors should do? Now, I'd heard in the past from some of your predecessors that, oh, gee, there's a privacy problem. Yeah. I don't see the privacy problem. Just give them the address and give them what the person owes. If they've got a bone to pick with the IRS, fine, then let the IRS deal with that. But it seems to me the failure has been, and what started us on our debt collection bill, which is now law, but Ways and Means has not yet applied it to IRS, mm -hmm. is that uh, they had this 64 billion possible collectible, 110 billion written off that they just given up on. And uh, I just think if we can nip this in the bud, and I realize some are bankruptcy cases and this kind of thing, uh, that we would be way ahead of the game yeah. in terms of uh, what the rest of us are doing. Well, there's no doubt. I think there is opportunity, and there may well be opportunities to work with the private sector in a lot of respects on that and other matters. I, I do think, though, that to graft, to graft, as was attempted in a pilot, to, to sort of graft, you know, a private sector debt collection onto what we've got now is, is only going to frustrate the private sector as well as the public sector. I mean, we really have to rethink the whole process. Unfortunately, this is not as simple a problem as, as we might like it to be. I do believe, though, if you, I mean, I guess I'm an optimist or I wouldn't be here, but I think the way to look at it is a great deal of opportunity to improve the entire process if we can rethink it from top to bottom. And in that process, there may well be opportunities simply to work with the private sector on certain aspects of this. But to just do it now, you know, as was shown in this pilot, is probably just going to frustrate everybody. Well, the pilot, one of them was just so phony, it was unbelievable. They gave five-year-old debt and hoping it would fail. And that bothered me about that administration of the IRS. And uh, you're a fresh broom around there. You can make some choices. It would seem to me as a former executive myself, you can put your own organization on it for the first 15, 30 days, get the letters out, so forth, see what happens. But then we ought to move beyond that. 
and I would hope you'd take a very careful look at that. Sir. Uh, allocation of trust funds. One of the things that's concerned me over the years is when the trust funds come in on the highways, on the Social Security, on Medicare, they really sort of sit around and they don't get allocated specifically to a trust fund until a formula is applied sometimes weeks later, months later. Have you had a chance to look at that question? Yeah, I, I, only, only generally. I think I'm going to ask Mr. Music to answer that one. Okay. Uh, one of the problems we have with that is, is that the way the, the paper-based systems were built, and it was a, based on a coupon, where the taxpayer would submit one payment, and there's probably some 100 trust funds, but on that coupon you can fill in a blank that says 720 and submit your payment. Really, you can't tell how to allocate that until the return comes in later. Now, what is being done to address that is a couple of things, that the systems that are currently being built that the CFO's organization has been working in the modernization plan is to have detailed transactions in those systems. The problem is until you get a general ledger that will accept detailed transactions, you still need to post them at a summary level. So that's being addressed. The other issue is, is for those people that would continue to be on a paper-based system, is there a tax, or not a tax, but is there a burden issue with them to break that out and provide it? Because basically what they would have to do is to submit the 720 return every time they send in a payment to show where the differences were between the trust fund payments. Uh, what would you consider, Commissioner, the major problem besides the reorganization, the attitude change, and all the rest? What do you see as your major problem? Well, of course, there are different priorities at different right. times. I, the, the, I'd say that, without a doubt, the most uh, unfortunate but most essential problem that we simply have to deal with is simply converting year 2000 to make it work, because if that doesn't happen, you know, none of the other things we're talking about are going to mean anything. I mean, we simply will not be able to continue to function. And I mean, the, the consequences of not dealing with this appropriately are really not exaggerated. Uh, they really are quite severe. I mean, we could be in a situation where you wouldn't be able to get refunds out, you wouldn't be able to collect money, so that we just can't allow that to happen. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, in the case of the IRS, uh, this is a massive problem that is compounded by the age of the systems that we have to renovate. Um, you know, I just saw, uh, you know, in one of the trade magazines that General Motors reported to the SEC uh, that they're, as they're required to do, that they estimate 360 to 500 million dollars to, to deal with their year 2000 problem for General Motors. Well, that's about half, uh, what we're, uh, perhaps less than half of what we're dealing with. And I can assure you that, because I know some of the people there, that General Motors has a much deeper bench of experienced managers in technology than we do. We have some very good ones, but we have a very thin, thin one. So I have to say that I am personally giving my own personal top priority to uh, working with the people that are that are working with this problem, and um, that I think is 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 a, is, a, is a, you know an unexpected but very challenging short-term problem. I think uh, putting it in in sequence, I think. As a short term, the, the next most important thing is to deliver some improved short term service improvements to the taxpayers because they just expect it. And we are doing that in this filing season. I mean, electronic filing is up 25%, and we've got much better phone service than we had previously. Uh, and we've improved some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, ability of taxpayers to get personal help when they need it on particular problems through open houses and that sort of thing. So there's a whole long list of things like that that we're doing short term. None of that is really going to solve these problems. And you've identified two of them. One is debt collection and the other is financial statements just in this hearing, both of which get to the root of fundamental organizational processes. So that's why we have to, I think, upgrade the technology and modernize the organization. On the year 2000 situation, I know you have a whole series of different uh, machinery hardware over there. Uh, how optimistic are you that you can get the basic work done so it's operational, let's say, by mid-1999. Is that where the target is now? or what? Actually, our target is January of 99. Our target yeah. is to have, because the way it works with filing seasons, we really have to get most of our tax-sensitive systems uh, upgraded, either, either replaced or renovated, in most cases renovated, by January of 99. And that is our goal. And, you know, there's a whole list of different categories. Uh, on some of the areas, some of the most critical areas, actually, we're in quite good shape. On the application programs themselves, which are the, you know, the actual ones that contain the logic, those are, those are in pretty good shape. Um, I think that um, the place that we have the most risk uh, is really in two areas. Uh, one is in our telecommunications network. 
which unfortunately is, is a very diverse and not very, um, uh, <laughs> well, not very well integrated, integrated network. And the other one is in some of these mini computers, what they call the tier two platforms, of which we have about uh, 54 different varieties. Uh, those are, those are um, uh, going to be complex primarily from the point of view of testing. We have the right software to, to, to make it work, but the testing process is going to be a problem. So I think those are the two that we're concentrating our most effort on right now. Thank you. We'll get back to some of the computer questions a little later. I now uh, yield 10 minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, the ranking Democrat on the committee, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Horn, and thank you for uh, calling this hearing today. Uh, th this is truly a day when we celebrate the long-suffering American taxpayer. And you can imagine uh, uh, what a fantasy it is to be up here having a chance to question the IRS. I mean, I'm sure that uh, the members here are the envy of millions of Americans <laughs> who would like this opportunity, particularly today. So uh, on behalf of those uh, millions of Americans who uh, would like this opportunity. I have some questions for you, Mr. Asadi, and I, I appreciate you being here. I know what a busy day this is for you. And uh, when, you, when you think that this is an agency that processes over 200 million uh, uh, tax returns and reviews more than 2 billion documents, if I'm correct, uh, collect over 1.5 trillion in revenue, and if I'm correct, uh, 52 million refunds, have, uh, which total about 72 billion, for this past, for this tax year, have already been issued. Is that correct? That's right. So you've uh, uh, you've been pretty busy, particularly with the technology that dates back to the 70s, some of the 60s, some uh, even and, the 60s. and some of the 60s. And I I, I think your uh, that toll free line that you have is about 26 million calls that you've uh, answered for the 1998 filing season. Oh yeah, already it's yeah. Mm -hmm. So what what we have a uh, uh, a uh, Internal Revenue Service, we have to recognize, handles a tremendous amount of, of, of work, uh, 25 million returns, I think, in the last three days. So there's, you know, we can well understand the complexities that you have to deal with, and you, I'm sure, can understand the concerns that we as members of Congress have to make sure that our constituents uh, believe that they're being treated fairly, with respect, being given the information they need in order to comply with the tax code. Now, uh, Commissioner, in the Washington Post this weekend, we read about how the IRS pursued a man to collect a second tax payment of $2,600, even though the man had a canceled check, to prove that he already had paid the $2,600 in taxes. I think you're probably familiar with the story. And in recent months, we've heard about taxpayers receiving notices for millions of dollars in tax liability and taxes applied to the wrong accounts. Uh, the GAO identified three cases in which the IRS pursued taxpayers for additional taxes after they'd already paid because the IRS lacked accurate data. Now, how do these kinds of mistakes occur? And uh, what do you do to rectify some of these matters and, and to prevent reoccurrences? I think the people would be interested, uh, particularly those people who right now at this moment may be watching and say, sure. you know, I have, I have this kind of a problem and what do I do about it? Well, first, let me just say, and the example of the gentleman who uh, sent in his canceled check, and you know, still that wasn't good enough. Uh, I mean, the, the there are some things that we just have to basically uh, rely on and, and move towards a change in point of view at the IRS, let's say, attitude, because I think some mistakes will always happen given those volume of information. I mean, even in your private credit card business, you'll have a check that doesn't. I mean, in that case of that check it was actually two separate banks that. Uh, that, 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 that made an error, which, which will happen given the billions of transactions. I think the, the, the important thing, though, from the point of view of what we need to do about it in the taxpayer is that we should not be attempting to fold that burden back on the taxpayer. If a taxpayer, and in fact our procedures do say that if, uh, you know, if a taxpayer sends in a proof of payment like a canceled check, it should be incumbent upon the IRS people to take ownership of that problem, as with any other kinds of problems, and fix it. Um, so I think at, at a sort of a root level, I think the answer to your question is we need to become more of a, think of ourselves more as problem solvers that of a taxpayer, and that's a, that's a good example of a fairly simple one actually, uh, present, presents us with a problem uh, that they have and it's a reasonable problem that, uh, that we should take ownership of that problem and not try to bounce it back 
either from one office to another within the IRS or, or as in this case, bounce it back to the taxpayer. And we're attempting to do that. I think there is some success in that. If you look at these problem-solving days that we've had, that's, that's a perfect example of what we're trying to do, where we've had uh, office hours open on, on relatively convenient times, like nights and weekends, and taxpayers who've had a problem, whatever it is, can come in, talk to somebody face-to-face. -face. And the big point, though, is not just that we're open and they can talk face-to-face, -to -face, but we've made a commitment that we'll take ownership of that problem and do the best we can to resolve it. It won't always be resolved to the satisfaction of the taxpayer. And, you know, it's interesting. Taxpayers are pretty intelligent in this way. They understand the difference between getting the answer that they hope to get, which they can't always get because it depends on the law, versus getting the right kind of service and getting people to serve them correctly. And in these problem-solving days, we've gotten very good grades from taxpayers on that score. So I think those are some of, the, some of the basic things. Now, beyond that, of course, as I said in my statement, we really have fundamental technology weaknesses in the IRS that put a burden on the employees. L let me know, ask that, you about that a minute, yeah. if I may, Commissioner. Uh, the chairman has uh, ably raised the issue uh, for quite a while now about the year 2000 and the impact that's going to have uh, the so-called Y2K dilemma, which all agencies are facing. But in other hearings we've had, we've also had the issue of the vulnerability of government computers to hackers. I can't think of, of any area which could yield a better windfall for hackers than to have the opportunity to go into the IRS systems and rearrange some accounts. Uh, my question to you is, since you admit that your technology is weak, to handle the existing system absent interference. How is your system set up to handle hacking? How serious a problem is it? And have you identified uh, losses of revenue because of it? Well, first of all, it's absolutely a serious problem. And uh, there are hackers that uh, attempt to get into uh, our website and other places uh, uh, you know, from time to time. Without a doubt, it's a serious problem. And we have, in fact, established, uh, it was before I got there, but established a special security office uh, to focus on <coughs> precisely this problem uh, with some two people, led by two people, uh, uh, one of which came from GAO, that are actually very excellent people that are focused precisely on identifying and preventing those threats. Um, but has this actually resulted in any loss of revenue or rearrangement of accounts? I don't believe that they ha it has, and I think the reason is simply because knowing the, the seriousness of this threat, the basic strategy is to wall off our internal systems and not allow external access to them, which is one of the reasons why the electronic filing process you know, is not as simple as it would like to be. I mean, the, the issue of how to advance electronic filing and electronic commerce in general, while still dealing with the security problem, is one of the really difficult trade-offs that we have to make, and so, so we're doing it very carefully. So I appreciate you saying that you don't believe you've lost any revenue, but let me ask another subtly different question. How secure is the personal information yeah. which taxpayers give to IRS, which, as all of us understand, is highly personal? How secure is that information? Well, I think the answer I gave was not just limited to revenue. I think that there is, I'm not aware of any instances where there's been any personal taxpayer information that's been accessed through hackers um, because of the point of, of, of I said, that, that all of the sensitive information is walled off. It isn't available. It isn't, I mean, it's, it's firewalled as the case, as it is from, from any external access. So uh, th this is basically the strategy that has to be pursued, and we have to be very careful to make that sure that stays, uh, that stays walled off. It does present the difficulties of trying to make uh, information more accessible and get more electronic filing while still maintaining this security. So this is one of the things that slows us down, but it has to because we have to, we have to be secure in terms of our, uh, our data. What, what do you do when you've identified that a hacker has attempted to attack the IRS database? Well, of course, it's, it's right now it's limited to things that can come in on the Internet, which is walled off from our basic internal data. But as I say, there is a, there is a, there are, there is a number of offices that focus on that, and the most important office is the one that it was within information technology that basically tries to track these problems and make sure that we've got the, the, the um, security systems in place to, to not let them penetrate our data. But we also have within our uh, inspection service uh, an internal security uh, small unit, few people, that really focus, that are specialized in trying to investigate those kinds of, those kinds of threats. 
Uh, I'd like to uh, direct in a question to Mr. Music. Uh, the GAO identified weaknesses in IRS controls over cash receipts at its tax service centers. Uh, for example, it noted that uh, individuals opening checks and cash and observed payments were not logged or recorded at the point of receipt to immediately assure accountability. Um, what does, uh, what is the IRS, uh, uh, how, what's their view as far as uh, current controls over cash and checks at service centers? Well, on that specific issue, I think that you uh, will probably note that the GAO also gave us some credit for identifying that ourselves as a problem, and there has been an effort underway uh, for the last several months in every service center to track that, but the, the focus would be is to get control of that check as soon as it comes in the door, get it stamped in and get it controlled. And I think that uh, we're looking at all procedures and all service centers, and then there'll be a, an issue in a consolidated way. The uh, service center directors are, are considering all those issues to get control of those. Well, let it be said that, you know, that issue was raised as a matter of record, but it should also be said that I think we can have confidence that most uh, of the people who work for IRS are honest, uh, uh, diligent uh, Americans who are doing the right thing and making sure that uh, they take uh, uh, total custody and care with taxpayers' dollars. But uh, that's why it's, it's unusual to hear of problems with the handling of cash receipts, and it's uh, comforting to know that uh, not only that you brought that up, but you're taking care to assure better handling of cash. At this point, I'd be glad to yield back my time. Uh, yes, we'll have uh, more time to pursue some of the questioning. Let me just go into a couple of issues that are going to be raised after you leave by various witnesses that uh, represent a part of, shall we say, the IRS outside community, such as the American Bar Association's section on taxation. One of the things their witness will recommend is that there should be an undersecretary of taxation to whom the assistant secretary for tax policy would report and the commissioner of IRS would report. Do you have any feelings on that uh, proposal? Well, <laughs> I'm having, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think I'm having enough uh, work of reorganizing the whole IRS without re reorganizing the Treasury Department. I, I really don't have any comment on that. I think that would be a matter for the secretary and the administration really to, to talk about. Yeah, I have a great uh, dubious view about it personally. I think when you have major uh, operational groups within a particular department, I think the commissioner ought to report directly to the secretary. And uh, that's such a sensitive area, it seems to me, that uh, that uh, would be one route. Now, the other possibility here is to whom should the general counsel of IRS report? You, the general counsel of Treasury, or the undersecretary of taxation that the taxation section of the American Bar suggests that be the outcome. How do you feel about where the general counsel of IRS should yeah. report? Well, I mean, of course, this is, I've only been here four months, and I mean, I have to say that is not an area that I've had a lot of problems with. I mean, it's, it's been working okay from, and from my point of view, and uh, I've tried to focus my priorities where, where you know, the need is the greatest. and, and uh, I, I told Stuart Brown, after I'd been there a couple months, the chief counsel, I said, look, your area doesn't seem to be broke, okay, so I'm going to work on some other stuff. Just keep, keep going. Um, and so, I mean, I suppose there are some arguments, you know, longer term, be, being serious about it, that, that, that you could argue it either way. But, but it hasn't been one, honestly, that I've focused a lot of my attention on because it seems to be working okay. In terms of the uh, types of uh, work that the general counsel currently does, do you feel that that council should really report to the commissioner because they affect policy issues with which you're concerned? As I, I said, Mr. Chairman, I, I've said that I don't see a need to change it from the way it is now. Mm -hmm. It seems to be working, working okay. I mean, if the, there is a proposal in the legislation to change it, and if, if they change it, that'll, I'm sure that'll, that'll be fine too. It just hasn't been one of the areas, honestly, to be, to be real honest with you, that I've focused a lot of attention on thinking through one way or the other, and it does seem to be to be working fine. And as I said, there are a lot of other areas that, that, that I don't think are working so well, so I've focused my attention on those. So I'm just being honest, I haven't really given that one a lot of thought. Well, I can appreciate that, but when you were a chief executive officer, I assume the general counsel reported yes. to you. Yes, that's right. 
Yeah, I would think that's the normal way general counsels report. And I guess I worry about an independent general counsel that does heaven knows what when you're the people Congress is holding, ex you and the secretary are the people that Congress is holding responsible. And if you don't have control over your own lawyers to a sense, it just seems a strange thing. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. Now, the, as you know, the reform bill, so-called, is over in the Senate. Hasn't been acted on yet. Uh, the question is, should that board be advisory rather than a governing board? Any feelings on that? Um, well, I think that the way that it's been structured in the legislation as it passed the Senate Finance Committee, as far as the, the powers of the board goes, uh, I think strike a good balance. I mean, you know, this has been debated a lot, and there's been a lot of, uh, I think, good discussion over how this would work in the context of a government agency like the IRS. And I guess I, I would say that I would very much support the legislation as it is in the Senate right now. I, I, think it, I think it strikes a good balance. It does give quite a few powers for the board, and it, of course, interacts with this question that you raised earlier about what should be the case and how it should be organized in the Treasury Department. Because if the legislation goes through, you'll now have a new element, which will be this board, which will have not complete powers in the sense of a corporate board, but, but pretty important powers. And I, I am optimistic, if we can get the right kind of people appointed to this board, that it can provide some a fresh perspective, private sector perspective, and a longer term perspective with some continuity than maybe we've had, had before, which was one of the things that uh, Senator Kerry and Congressman Portman you know, tried to design in in their, in their uh, proposal. So I, I, I think it strikes a pretty good balance. And I think that uh, on that regard, that the legislation is, is very helpful. And I just hope it can be passed as soon as possible. Another area that uh, we ought to discuss is when a taxpayer has a grievance with the IRS as to what route should they pursue. Should they pursue an administrative law judge route that maybe a group of administrative law judges are within Treasury but not within IRS? Uh, that's certainly what some agencies do. Should there be a special appeal process set up? Do you have any thinking on that at this yeah. point? Actually, I think that uh, here again, this legislation has some good things. In I mean, the IRS actually has an appeals process that's, that's quite independent of the other functions, and which is one of the things that uh, even in the strongest critics have given quite uh, good marks for. Now, it hasn't, it hasn't uh, operated across all the dimensions of the IRS uh, as much as it could. And in the, and in the legislative proposal, there is um, one of the provisions in there that I, is, to, is, to, is to require or to set it up so that this appeals group will have more involvement in certain kinds of collection cases, which have been some of the, some of the more uh, difficult cases that we've had. Right now, it focuses more on the exam cases. And I think that seems to be the direction that the, that the Senate uh, favors. And, and I, I think that, that's actually a very good direction, because we do have this process set up that really is quite independent of the, of the uh, uh, enforcement functions. And, and I think uh, most people give it pretty good marks for doing an independent job. So I think if we can make use of it effectively in some of the more newer areas that have been identified that could be a good solution. The uh, proposal has been made that there ought to be an independent inspector general solely within IRS. Right now, the inspector general of the Department of the Treasury would handle matters within IRS. Any comment on that? Well, again, here this legislation has some big changes in, in mind. Um, as it is now, actually, there is a rather large inspection service. It's over 1,100 uh, people uh, that cover both audit and, uh, and investigations. Um, and that is part of the IRS that reports to the commissioner, although it's independent of the other functions. Then on top of that, you've got now the Treasury Inspector General that has certain authority. Um, as I understand the current proposal in the Senate bill, uh, it would take a major part of the inspection service out of the IRS and create another inspector general uh, group that would be solely focused on tax administration um, in order to give a greater degree of independence than is perceived to exist today. Uh, I, I've, I think, argued that there, there are perhaps ways that you could strengthen the independence of the existing inspection service and convert it into effect an, an IG within the IRS. Uh, I think the Senate has, has decided that's not quite sufficient for them, and they want to actually move part of it up to um, the Treasury. I think that can work. I, 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 can, I, I think we can live with that. There were certain requests that, that I, I suggested that be put into that legislation if they were going to do it that way, uh, which, which they've tried to, the Senate Finance Committee has tried to accommodate. So I think we're moving in the direction 
of, of whether it be done through the way it's done in the Senate or some other way, to having a greater degree of independence than currently is perceived to exist with the inspection service, which I think is, is, a, is good. I support that. It, it's maybe some still open as to exactly how that's accomplished. The uh, gentleman from Ohio and you in exchange thoughts on computer security. How about non-computer security? For example, when the cash comes in in various checks, uh, as I understand the General Accounting Office report, there's no real lockbox. It goes through maybe three or four different layers where checks could be removed, altered in some way. How much of a problem is that? And is the fact that right now you have no surveillance cameras, I believe, and I wonder if that's been a problem with the uh, Treasury Employees Union and is something that has to be negotiated, or how much have you had a chance to look at well, just plain old uh, security? I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Music to, to answer part of that. But, but let me just make one comment, though, to, just so that you're aware of this, is that actually the part of the problem we're dealing with here is only the part that deals with the checks that actually come into the IRS Service Center, which is the vast minority of the money that comes in, because most of the money actually comes in electronically now through our, through our banks, uh, through the uh, federal deposit system, or through lockboxes, which we do outsource the lockbox. Most of the checks actually come in through banks directly into the lockbox, which unfortunately actually was the cause of that problem that was in the newspapers. But so we're only talking about the checks which come into the service centers, and, and there is where the issue was identified. But I will allow, ask Mr. Music to answer that question about the surveillance. Well, I, on the uh, surveillance issue, again, I would have to say that the group that uh, Mr. Rosati referred to on uh, the security unit has taken a look at all surveillance, or, or all security issues, not only uh, computer security, but fiscal security around service centers, within service centers. And, They've got that broken down into an effort to try to address uh, all service center issues, all district offices, and over the next few years. But again, that's going to be an extensive effort, and they're going to have to take a look at some of the risk and the uh, and the uh, the funding that we have to to try to take care of those issues. I mean, the, the truth is, is that apparently, as I understand it, up until like a couple of years ago, there wasn't really a defined group that was that was in charge of specifically looking at these security issues. And I think uh, the uh, initiative that was taken about a year ago or whenever, approximately a year or two years ago, to set up this uh, special security group with some very, very qualified people. I think the leader of it is a person that came from uh, GEO. They're not only looking at computer security. They, they're looking at everything from fences to surveillance cameras. And a lot has been done, especially in the computing centers. I think the service centers, we still need more work. I thank the gentleman and now yield 10 minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, back to uh, Chairman Rosati. Do you plan to modify the technology modernization blueprint so that it reflects the concepts in your modernization plan? And if so, uh, will this dramatically affect the implementation and projected costs of the technology modernization blueprint? Yes, that's, a, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, we tried to look at that very, very carefully. and. Uh, I think that the answer is, is really this way, that, that the way that the blueprint is set up now, I think it, it, is, it is very appropriate and very much supports the direction that we want to go organizationally as well. It's, not, it's, not a, it, it's set up in such a way that it only has detailed specifications for the very beginning, the very first two pieces of, of the blueprint. And those are very generic, very general kinds of uh, communications technology which will support any organization structure. Um, as we get downstream, as we get further along into the, into the later releases, as they're called, uh, th there, will, there will be changes, uh, undoubtedly. But those are, those are, ch those are changes that, to, to releases that haven't really been defined in detail yet anyhow. So we've got more than enough time to do that. Um, the, 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 and I will provide you, Mr. Kucinich and the committee, a, a chart which shows how all this fits together, if, if you would like, that just sort of summarizes on one page of the timeline. But the basic idea is that this year, 98, we're really focused heads down on the year 2000 problem to get most of the renovation done in 99. We intend to award the prime contract uh, to about the end of this year uh, towards uh, December of 99 and really uh, December of 98. And then in 99 and in the early part of year 2000, we would be working on primarily these early releases that are, that are very general, that are more or less the foundation for the future work. And then, you know, by the time we get to about two years down after the year 2000 has, has turned, we will have also, we hope, been 
well down the way in terms of our organizational changes, and then we will really begin to work on some of the uh, more specific business systems. So, I mean, part of what this says, of course, is this is a long-term process. I mean, we're talking about years here, and we have to do it really in, in small pieces in order to control the risk. What's your target date for uh, making sure that your system is in place for the year 2000? I mean, you, you obviously yeah. need lead time to right. prepare for a tax year. What's the date? The date is to get, the, the, the target date is to get virtually or, or nearly all of the replacement or renovation of the computer programs and the related infrastructure such as the communications network and the tax law changes, which are many this year, get that all done by the January of 99 prior to the next tax season. And then, of course, we have the tax season. That then gives us the remainder of 1999 to do a very comprehensive test, which is absolutely required. I mean, you absolutely have to do this comprehensive test because there's many things changing. That's the, that's the, the grand strategy here. And, uh, you know, we're focusing every day on trying to make that happen. Well, I know you'll keep this committee posted. Yes, sir. Because if it, uh, if it doesn't happen on time, we would like the privilege of declaring a taxpayer's holiday. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. The, um, uh, in, the, in your testimony, you highlighted the need for restructuring legislation to include the flexibility of hiring a leadership team and a technical team. Uh, why do you need legislation to do that? Uh, well, of course, we're, we, we don't, we, we are doing some of that now within the current legislation, but there are some restrictions on, uh, for example, the ability to bring in people, uh, I mean, many of the people that we may want to bring in, and I'm only talking about a, a restricted number here, I mean, we're not talking about hundreds of people, but it's 20 or 30 people, many are not going to come in necessarily for a whole career in the government. They may be coming in on three or four year periods, um, and uh, right now the the uh, provisions are not too, don't make it too easy to do that. And also, frankly, the ability to uh, adjust some of the pay ceilings uh, is another key item in, in this bill that would give us for a restricted number of people the ability to uh, increase the, uh, the pay ceiling. So those are two of the important things. Also, with respect to the general workforce, there are some authorities in there that would allow us to, to experiment with different kinds of, of um, pay and grading schemes for different kinds of, of, of uh, workers which would also be helpful. I'm, I'm uh, again, appreciative of your presence here, particularly given uh, the day today. But also, it's significant that you are here, and it's important that you're here today, because this is a day when people need to hear from, uh, f from their government and from the IRS as to, uh, as to issues of accountability. And you've uh, certainly uh, prepared yourself well for this day. I, I have a question that uh, gets a little bit away from the technical issues here and back to issues that relate to the sensitivity of the IRS to the taxpayers. Uh, occasionally in my office I'll receive calls from people who feel that they're being treated harshly. Of course I imagine it's very difficult to ask people to pay bills and they might be substantial bills to IRS and, and do it in a, in a way that's always sensitive, but what do you do as far as uh, uh, training personnel to make sure that, uh, that in these very difficult and sensitive moments of encounter with the taxpayers, that they're treating people with the utmost respect and courtesy. Mr. Yes, Mr. Kucinich, I do, I do see that problem, and I absolutely agree with that. That is very, very important. I think, you know, as I said, one of the overriding principles, I think, that, that I'm at least trying to sensitize people to or get, get the whole IRS to buy into is the idea that you know, we're there to help people solve problems. And even in the most difficult situations, we need to try to help people figure out the best way to cope with the situation they have. Do you have training programs well, where you go over these okay, things? Okay, I was going to say, one of the issues is it's a combination of things. It's not going to happen overnight. One of, the, one of the big points is simply getting across the idea that this is our goal, okay, that this is one of the things that we need to do, and setting up examples of how it can be done. The problem-solving days that we did were very good examples, and the employees very much like that because we did bring people together and we said, look, we, they were called problem-solving days. And we took ownership of those problems. And I would say as approximately the numbers were that like 60% of the taxpayers were able to get a resolution the way they wanted it and the other 40% were not. But, but like 95% of the cases were closed in a way that at least 
was able to get the taxpayer to recognize, okay, this is, this is the best we can do and this is the solution people gave us. I, I'd like to interject to a, a different uh, measure here, though, and that is that y there's an inherently unequal power relationship between the IRS and the ordinary taxpayer. You, could, you will admit that. And, and given that that's implicit in the exchanges that take place, uh, how do you sensitize the employees about their exchanges because they're really coming from a position of tremendous power to reach into someone's personal finances. They, uh, what, do you, they, what do you do? What do you tell the IRS employees about how they need to regard that powerful position they have? Well, I, again, I think that this is one of the fundamental cultural changes that we need to, we need to make, which is to sensitize and to ex explain to people that the goal is not only to collect the money and to, and to get the get the, uh, you know, the, 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 the result that the law provides, but to, but to try to find the best way to help the taxpayer understand that situation and cope with it. And part of it, is tr part of it is simply changing the whole strategy of what we do, but part of it is also training. I didn't get a chance to answer your other question. Is there is a lot more that we need to do with training. I mean, you mentioned that, but I'm sorry I didn't respond to it. Uh, in, the 90, in the next season that we're going through, in the 99 season, we're going to put a special emphasis on training. And there's really two kinds of training. There's technical training to explain, you know, what the tax law is, but there's also training on how to deal with conflict situations where there's conflict. And there, are, there, are, there is training modules that are available to deal with these kinds of things. Uh, we're going to try to do more of that within the IRS to train people. And I think there's a third one. There's a three or maybe there's two more. One is the, what is the measurement system. I mean, one of the things that's been observed is that if employees are measured solely on the basis of, you know, for example, uh, the business results and worse yet, just how much money they collect, that's going to drive people in one direction. We, we really are changing that very radically. This makes a big difference. We're going to measure uh, eventually every transaction that we have with a taxpayer from the taxpayer's point of view. In other words, we're going to do like business. We're going to actually ask taxpayers, even on audits and collection actions. We're starting to do this on a test basis now. We're going to ask them to rate us on how, how well they've been served by that transaction. And we did this on an experimental basis with these problem-solving days. Um, and we're eventually, and I say this is going to take a few years, we're going to eventually build that into the performance evaluation system so that people are evaluated not just on the business results, but, the trans but how, how it appeared to the, to the taxpayer. I, um, I think people really are concerned, Commissioner, about how they're treated. I mean, that's how so much yeah. of, of the right. issue about IRS reform came about, because there's a perception out there. Now, it, yes. it may not be justified in 99% in of the cases, but there is a perception out there that people are not always treated courteously or fairly. And it's heartening to know that you're addressing the culture of the IRS in its relationship with the taxpayer. Because I, I think what's important for everyone to know is you know, all of those public servants work for the taxpayers. I mean, you know, while we want to make sure that we get the revenue we need to run the country, uh, it's still our government. And the IRS should never be, I think, separated from the responsibilities and accountability that we would expect of other government officials in terms of, of uh, courteousness and, uh, and even kindness. And that might be a tough thing to raise when you're trying to collect a debt. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, and maybe we're asking people to do more than, they, than it's humanly possible. But at the IRS, given the power that the IRS has, I think that it's appropriate to uh, request that a little bit more be done in terms of respecting the inequality of the situation and of asking for uh, the employees to bend over backwards to be uh, courteous and kind to the public. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I, that's basically the whole thrust of what we're trying to Thank do you. with the IRS. Thank you, Commissioner. Do you have any more questions or comments? Uh, I'm, I'm concluded with Mr. Rosati. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner, uh, just a few final questions here. Uh, we've talked uh, earlier about the write-off of money, the deal of collecting and so forth. A lot of those, as I mentioned earlier, we know are bankruptcy cases that go in and out.
what I would emphasize is a point that Mr. Dodaro made, and that is successful restructuring of IRS on a programmatic level, as well as the ability of GAO and the Congress and the American public to do oversight and to understand IRS programs is key. It, it, fixing the financial systems is key in doing that, that we need to have good quality, timely data to be able to understand why problems are occurring, how to fix those problems, and frequently within IRS, the problem does, cannot be fixed where it occurs, but it has to be fixed much, much further upstream in the process. And right now, we frequently don't have the data that would allow us to decompose a problem and resolve it and prevent it from happening systemically. So until these systems are fixed, we're going to be handicapped. Uh, Mr. Coots, uh, you're Associate Director for Government-Wide Accounting Financial Man Management in the Accounting Information Management Division of the General Accounting Office. What would you uh, respond to what you've heard the Commissioner say, the Chief Financial Officer say? Mr. Chairman, I would want to uh, make a couple of observations on the chart that Mr. Dodaro spoke about. Fine. And we've talked about to this, uh, to Mr. Music about this several times, the composition of the pieces of that pie you see up there. And I think one important observation I would make overall is that the IRS does not choose the customers essentially that are in this pot or this uh, inventory of unpaid assessments. By definition, I think the folks in there are bad credit for the most part. We did look at a sample of 730 different items, and Mr. Sebastian and I looked at every single one of those together between us, and we found some very interesting insights into this that would tell you why the IRS is only able to collect 13 cents on the dollar. And we can get into some of that in detail if you would like. Well, I would like it because I'll tell you, the average taxpayer, including this average taxpayer, takes a look, as I did several years ago that I mentioned earlier, where over $100 billion had been written off essentially since 1990. And uh, there was another pot where they said, oh, but we can collect the other, and that was about $64 billion. And I think your chart well shows that that's a little bit of dreaming to think that you'll get that much money out of it. And you might want to explain that in some detail so we all understand it. All right, let me go through a couple of the different pieces of the pie up there, and I, got, I have some details with me to uh, walk you through that. First of all, with regards to the amounts that are considered collectible, which is the $28 billion, I'll give you some of the details of what we saw in our sample of 730. We saw 80 cases in there of the 192 that had some collectability that were installment agreements. These installment agreements were with individuals and businesses primarily, and there were also some estates. Of these 80 items, 16 were estate cases, and those were generally 100% collectible. 61 of the cases were individuals that had entered into installment agreements with the IRS, and the other three represented corporations. So again, we saw some or all of those as being collectible. We saw 36 cases in our sample where the taxpayer had subsequent to our sample pull actually paid in full or in part the taxes that were owed, and of course we considered that to be collectible. The money was in the door. And we saw 17 cases where the taxpayer had a history of allowing the IRS to do a refund offset, where in the current year they had a refund due, and the IRS offset that refund against the past taxes due. So we projected that forward for those cases, and we found some collectability there. And the final area where we saw some significant collectability was taxpayers that had a recent history of compliance. Established corporations, 10 of them were very large established corporations, and other individuals that were uh, having a history of compliance. So that was what I saw in the, in, in Mr. Sebastian and I saw in that sliver with the $28 billion. Let me give you a couple of details in that other piece, the uncollectible amount of receivables, and this is, is quite interesting. There were 267 other items we found that there was not collectability that were classified as taxes receivable. Of these amounts, we saw 75 that were considered hardship cases by the IRS, where the IRS had deemed that the taxpayer had ins insufficient revenue or assets to pay the taxes and thus was not pursuing collection. We saw 41 instances of the trust fund recovery penalties that have been mentioned several times here where individual officers had been assessed the amounts that the corporation was due, and that was also considered in our sample to be uncollectible. We did not see evidence of money coming in the door for those. 
We saw 21 individuals that were in bankruptcy, and we saw 15 uh, sample items where the assessments resulted from illegal acts. These were high dollar cases and the individuals were often in prison. From some of these illegal acts, which are taxable and involve multiple penalties, included drug trafficking, embezzlement, prostitution, international arms dealers, real estate fraud, and other tax fraud. So again, this is a, something that's a little bit different than your normal private sector taxes receivable. And then we found 10, individu 10 of the sample items where the IRS could not locate the taxpayer. So again, that gives you a flavor of the different components of the 62 billion and the 28 billion that made up the taxes receivable. Thank you. I now yield uh, 10 minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kusnich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to uh, continue. Uh, is it Mr. Coots? Coots. Yes. Okay, Mr. Coots's uh, uh, observations here and get into a more detailed discussion of the testimony where you talk about components of IRS's $214 billion of unpaid assessments in the pie chart that's represented yes. here. Let's go around this pie chart again. Okay. Uh, first of all, $76 billion in write-offs. Yes. In plain language, what does it mean when you write off a debt? In the private sector, it means you just write it off the books. In this case, the IRS is required to keep these things on the books for 10 or more years by, by statute. So we're keeping these on the books. So write-offs is basically something that uh, is uncollectible, but because of the requirement to keep it on the books, it's still there. As Gene mentioned, there's uh, FDIC and RTC cases in there that have absolutely no hope of collection. And for the most part, 148 or so of the sample items that we saw were corporations that had been defunct. Most of them had been defunct since the late 80s. Have you tracked, for example, if a corporation uh, becomes defunct, do you track if the incorporators go back into business uh, and start a new company? And do you, do you ever pursue those individuals for the back taxes? Or if they go in as incorporated, is it simply uh, uncollectible and, and you don't go after the individuals? I, are you talking about the trust fund recovery penalties we talked about right. earlier with, with the IRS folks? Right. We, we did see a number of instances where individuals that owned these corporations had multiple corporations that had defaulted on their payroll taxes. Uh, I think we saw one where there was, uh, I think there were eight different uh, modules that were outstanding from three different corporations for one individual. We saw a number of other cases where an individual business owner had several payroll taxes that were outstanding for different corporations. So that, as I think the IRS had said earlier, they kind of move around and, and start up businesses, and then they don't pay their taxes, and they kind of keep moving on. So there are multiple offenders. For in some people, family. then, I mean, it's a way of doing business. Is it that appears so, yes. Uh, how widespread is it? Can you put numbers on it in terms I, of the, the number of cases? Mr. Sebastian? There were 83 cases involving uh, trust fund recovery penalties, 16 of which we saw officers, um, in essence, uh, withholding uh, the payroll taxes uh, multiple times. So you're talking 16 of 83 cases that we reviewed. What happens when uh, payroll taxes aren't, aren't paid? What, what typically happens in those cases? Who do you, who's liable? Well, the corporation, of course, is liable, but also the IRS is able to assess for the amounts withheld from individuals for Social Security, hospital insurance, and individual withholdings, that amount of taxes. So there are multiple assessments that are outstanding with the business and the officers of the corporation. And that's one of the things. The initial pie that we had there was $236 billion. The reason that that pie is $214 billion is that there were duplicate assessments in the IRS system that we wrote off as part of our audit. And that related okay. primarily to these trust fund recovery penalties. So the IRS can only really collect the money once, but it was on the books in some instances four or five times. Uh, the other thing, Congressman, that's important to note here is that a lot of what's in that pie chart are interest and penalties Got that it. keep accruing on some of this old debt. And some of the debt in the write-off area, for example, goes back to the to the late 1980s, 1990 timeframe, and, and indeed, 
I think of our total, uh, the, the $214 billion assessments, about $136 billion of that are interest and penalties and not the original debt so, or the taxes that, that, are, uh, that are assessed so that the growth in this unpaid so, assessments category is largely driven by the interest and penalties. So that would, so in, in putting a dollar amount, uh, that, that uh, figure of 76 billion in write-offs would be corrected to about 30 billion then, is that correct? If you, if you eliminated the interest and penalties? That's a fair assessment, yes. Okay, so uh, it's still a significant oh, yes. uh, amount of money. Yes. And uh, to go back into it, who, who makes the decision as to whether a debt is written off or not? Basically, in this case, the, act, the absolute term of a write-off in, in sense of that it's not pursued anymore is right. governed by the legal statute of 10 years. And the IRS, once that 10-year period has elapsed, then they decide, you know, basically, uh, you know, that's the decision point at that point. What we're doing, uh, working with IRS to prepare the financial statements and then to do the audit is to provide a, a financial accounting of exactly what the nature of this uh, inventory is and what's, what can be realistically accepted to be accountable. So the terminologies that we're using here are embedded in the new accounting standards that have been put in place to make sure that the decision makers in the Congress and the IRS have accurate information. There's been a lot of assumptions made in the past years that a large part of this inventory would be actually collectible. And, and, and there have been pursuits to try to do that. Uh, the big point I would emphasize, which is very similar to what the Commissioner emphasized here, is that there has to be earlier identification and collection. A lot of these cases in here are, are several years old uh, where people can't be located, uh, there, there's been uh, failures of the corporation, and, and basically you're not, your ability to collect that old debt diminishes as time elapses, and, and there needs to be better information so that the IRS could age these and then attack the ones that are most recent. There's a point at which you pursue legal action to collect, right? You, you go to court, you file liens, correct? Right, and most, most of these corporations that are in the $76 billion have been through bankruptcy court, and now they are defunct. There's, there's nothing left to get. This is completely uncollectible. Fine, but you know, you've, you've explained that. The, the question I have, though, is that if you've filed some legal process, it becomes their names of the corporation becomes public record, correct? I can't answer that question. Does it? I, I'd have to, uh, uh, I would. We have attorneys with us. Yeah. Well, I, I, guess, yeah. I, I, guess it yeah. comes, I guess it comes to this. Yeah. If there are corporations who are avoiding paying millions of dollars in taxes, and they avoid all of the processes that you use to try to collect. Is there any way that, that these corporations can be made known publicly, that the principles can be made known so that we can see if they're trying to do business with the government again, if we're not, you know, if, if we're setting them up in business or anything like that? I mean, do, is there any way to know? Yeah. You don't know. I don't know if I can answer that question, but let me just clarify something because um, I'm not too sure that this, the, uh, that this is a collection issue. What they have defined here is, is uh, that... Excuse me. I, I understand. Let, let's say that I understand it's not a collection issue, but it's an issue of accountability for the people, even though you can't collect the debts. You've established that. You've well established that there's debts you cannot collect. What I'm asking is it's coming from a different direction. Who are these people who have beat the taxpayers out of billions of dollars, or millions in some cases? And can we find out, is there a list of corporations available? Can we find out so that, I mean, what stops these people from doing it all over again and stiffing the taxpayers and maybe getting government contracts and becoming um, a wealthy at the expense of the taxpayers uh, on one hand with government resources, on the other hand not paying their taxes? How do, how, how do we stop this? Congressman, under Section 6103 of the Internal Revenue Code, that information cannot be released. It is protected as taxpayer data, and the fact that someone, a taxpayer, be that a corporation or an individual, owes the government tax dollars is protected information. Now, if it goes into a bankruptcy court where there is a public record where this is an outstanding liability, you would have more information available. But 
right now as the statute is written, that information is protected. I, I'm all for privacy. Right. I think privacy is a fundamental American right. Mm -hmm. But we're talking here about 10 years past collection, mm -hmm. uncollectible debts. Do you keep a list of people who have gone into bankruptcy where then the name becomes public? Oh, exactly. But it, I, all I'm saying is that Did the, you keep such lists? the Internal Revenue Code would have to be changed to allow this information to be made well, public. Well, you know, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, you know, it may be that uh, since we, we've identified an area of vulnerability here, and we've identified that there is a scam, one of many scams that goes on as a way of trying to avoid paying taxes, uh, then this might be a relevant area to look at the code to find out if after a certain period in time people haven't paid, it's uncollectible, if that information then becomes public. I, I mean, if people don't pay their real estate taxes back in counties across the country, their name can be printed by the county auditor in the newspaper for a couple hundred bucks. And yet someone can claim a sacrosanct privacy if 10 years later they've stiffed the government for millions? I don't think so. And if it's that way, I think this might be an opportunity for us to look at the code and to change it. We need, we need to know who these people are. Yes. So they aren't doing it to us again. I, I completely agree with the gentleman. Uh, in the Debt Collection Act, which we authored and became law two years ago, we had to leave out the IRS because it's under the jurisdiction of the Committee on Ways and Means. Now, by doing that, uh, and that's where the privacy thing came from, I'm sure in good faith, but the fact is that if you got them under the Debt Collection Act, every time they applied for a government benefit, that would now be uh, caught. And they wouldn't get that government benefit if they owed the government money. And that's what started us in this debt collection. And when we saw what IRS had written off uh, under the previous administration of IRS, and I'm talking pre-Commissioner Rosati, I thought it was a national scandal, but apparently some committees here don't, and uh, we're just going to have to urge them again. Now, some of that got back to the pilot program in IRS on debt collection. And I wonder if uh, you could tell us what you know about that. The last I knew, Mr. Colby's subcommittee on appropriations that has jurisdiction over their funding uh, mandated on behalf of myself and uh, Ms. Johnson of Connecticut, who heads the Oversight Committee of Ways and Means, that there'd be a pilot project. And as I remember, one bundle of the pilot project, which I thought was an absolute phony by IRS, was five-year-old debt. And you've got to start in the first 30 days, as I've been saying, in 30, 50, 60, whatever, and follow up and not let it age, as the point was made, so that they think it's a grant. You know, it's unbelievable. They just think, oh, well, nobody cares. Why should I pay it? Well, it means you better get a decent collection effort. And that means IRS has its role to do in 30 days, I'd say, maybe 60 at the most, and then turn it over to private collectors. And I listened to a lot of nonsense from the then previous administration of the IRS that, oh, but that would affect the privacy law. I said, look, as I said earlier today, just give them the address and what they owe the taxpayers of the United States. Yeah, and there was, a, there was a lot of problems with that yeah. pilot, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Willis to uh, explain that. She's been uh, doing in-depth uh, analysis of that since its inception. And Mr. Please. Chairman, basically the Congress appropriated money for three pilots at IRS, only one of which was ever started. And as we got into that pilot, we recommended with the agreement of the IRS uh, commissioner that that pilot be stopped because it was running into a variety of problems from a systemic, you know, systems perspective, legal perspective, and operational perspective. We have since gone in and looked at the pilot and briefed you, Chairman Colby and, Colby and Chairman Johnson, on that pilot, which was very limited. One of the restrictions that was placed around the pilot was that they could only pilot the collection of debt by private uh, parties that IRS otherwise would not be working with. So these tended to be older accounts. They also tended to be uh, smaller accounts in some respects. 
since that time, we've been charged with working with IRS to redesign a pilot. And basically, based on our look at IRS systems and working with the new commissioner, we have come to the conclusion that until some of the basic problems with IRS's processes are fixed, it's going to be very difficult to design a pilot that will tell us anything about the use of private debt collectors that we can take forward in terms of putting firm programs into place. Let me point out one of the issues that is very, very critical, and it gets back to the timeliness problem. Right now, a big part of the problem with the debt is not how long it's been delinquent, but how long it took IRS to actually assess the additional tax after the tax return was filed. So that by the time the taxpayer is aware they owe additional tax, a substantial period of time has passed, sometimes two to three years. And at that point, there's interest, there's penalties, and there's a great deal more money in there than there would have been had it been assessed earlier in the process. Shortening that assessment time frame is critical to resolving the collection problems that the private debt uh, collectors faced in this pilot. That they have to be recent tax year debt that has you know, gone out for collection soon after being declared delinquent as well. And there are ways to shorten all of those processes, but they're going to require major reengineering efforts. Did uh, the GAO review Commissioner Rosati's plan for restructuring IRS? We, we've uh, taken a look at it. At this point, it's, a, as you know, a high-level concept statement. And we're, like a lot of other people, awaiting additional details. And, and uh, we'll take a closer look at it as the specifics well, my become point, more available. But yeah. as, a, as a general uh, proposition, I mean, we, as I mentioned, I think we have, it has a lot of merit. In, in terms of aligning uh, by different types of things. Well, I do too, but what I wanted to do was pick up yeah. Ms. Willis's point that was GAO satisfied that in the assessment of certain taxpayers' uh, filings uh, that the debt collection apparatus is apparently hinging on that in terms of the time period of that assessment. And if they take and procrastinate, I'm not saying anybody's doing something evil. I'm just saying their system now might not right. be geared to that point. And it seems to me on the commissioner's restructuring, that's a very basic point for him to deal with. Uh, uh, oh. Is that correct, yeah. Ms. Willis? Yeah. Yes, that, that's correct. And it's also a point that he recognizes and a point that's critical around the structuring of the system to address groups of taxpayers. Right. Part of the reason that that issue has not been addressed to date is the functional nature of IRS's organization. The people in collections have never had any accountability or responsibility for the assessment process and vice versa. The fact that it took this long to assess was not any way you know, reflected in the, the uh, returns processing or the exam functions performance measures. It became a problem for collections. So if we have a structure that's built around different categories of taxpayers, properly implemented, what it should allow us to do is go in and look at where the problems are occurring, and it does vary by type of taxpayer, and design strategies for intervention to prevent problems as well as to get the taxes assessed more quickly, design the specific systems to do that, and to resolve the problems that end up right now sitting in collections. I think the other aspect of that, Mr. Chairman, is the modernization blueprint that the Commissioner mentioned that's in its you know, high-level descriptions. But as it moves down, you need to define the business requirements, as you know, and have those validated so that they'll support the, that new uh, restructuring proposal, and that's really paramount that that gets done properly. And we've made recommendations, which the commissioners agreed to implement, to do that as the specifics of the restructuring proposals unfold. Mr. Music, is there anything you can uh, enlighten us with about the collection pilots that occurred? I believe you were chief financial officer then. Yes, but uh, that really came under Mr. Dow Dalrymple's area, who had left. It was under the collection function, and. Uh, Really, uh, my dealing with this is to get into what the data is when we pulled it out for the audit, and I think what uh, GAO has identified here, and I think that uh, just a simple change in wording to uh, 
the word unpaid assessments. We used to call that accounts receivable dollar inventory, and everybody focused on the word accounts receivable, and it really isn't an accounts receivable as we would uh, think of it. Well, I want to thank you for coming back uh, and uh, sharing some of those insights with us. Uh, staff on both the Democratic and the Republican side will have a few questions to submit to uh, this panel. And if you would, uh, you're still under oath, uh, give us as succinct an answer as you can. We'd like to put them in the record at this point without objection. But I'm particularly pleased that uh, both GAO and IRS were able to connect this year and uh, uh, they uh, got a favorable opinion. And that's important because in 1993, when a lot of us on this committee looked at this situation, we said there's two for sure we knew in 98 that wouldn't make it. One was the Department of Defense and the other was IRS. Right. Well, you surprised us. IRS made it. And I'm sure that's thanks to you and a lot of people, Art Gross, the Chief Information Officer and others over there. And uh, the Department of Defense will be dealing with tomorrow morning. So, uh, in other words, they've had two years to try and match the $25 billion up with acquisition and inventory. So we'll have that session tomorrow. I don't know if GAO is coming over. I think you are. I've read I, your I testimony. I will be here tomorrow. You'll be Chairman. here, yes. Uh, You're always looking for $25 billion wherever you can find it. <laughs> That's right. But uh, so are we. But I th I, if you have no other comments you want to make on Mr. Rosati's statement, uh, why, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we can move to the next panel. Yeah, that's we fine. can yeah. thank you all for coming, and uh, we appreciate the excellent advice you've given us. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. We now have panel three, uh, Mr. Stephan Tucker, the chairman-elect, Section on Taxation, American Bar Association. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Michael Marys, the chair of the Tax Executive Committee, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. We have Mr. Thomas H. Stanton, chair, standing panel on executive organization and management of the National Academy of Public Administration. Mr. Stanton will be accompanied by Mr. Herbert N. Jasper, member, standing panel on executive organization and management, National Academy of Public Administration. Gentlemen, you know the routine, so if you'll stand, raise your right hand. You swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The clerk will note that all four witnesses have affirmed, and we'll just go down the line in the order they are uh, on the uh, agenda. And Mr. Stephan Tucker, Chairman-Elect, Section on Taxation, American Bar Association, is first. Thank, Thank you for Mr. coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am presenting my testimony today on behalf of the ABA Section of Taxation, which is the national representative of the legal profession with regard to our tax system. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before your subcommittee today to discuss various proposals to restructure and reform the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, perhaps no committee is as attuned to the need for reform of the IRS than this committee, and we concur with your views as to the possibility of success under Commissioner Rosati. We, we have a great deal of confidence that with his background and his ability and, uh, both to focus on the organization and the systems and quite frankly to think outside the envelope that he will be successful. Uh, I, we think he needs a lot of help from Congress in terms of doing this and we are pleased that your committee is focusing on this. Um, we have been privileged on a number of occasions to work with the Commission on Restructuring the Internal Revenue Service, the members and staffs of the tax writing committees, and the representatives of both the service and the Treasury as they developed first the Commission's report and then the House and Senate bills. And we believe that a lot of thought has gone into this process, and we think that the number of the conclusions of the committee are quite important. Um, first thing we would like to focus on is governance and oversight. And we recognize that both the House and the Senate bills would create an IRS oversight board to handle the oversight of the Internal Revenue Service administration, management, conduct, direction, and supervision of the execution and application of the tax laws. And we were pleased to hear Commissioner Rosati say that he, in turn, is pleased with the Senate version of that particular bill. We are pleased that the Senate version includes a sunset provision. That was something that we recommended in the Senate Finance Committee hearings. We're pleased that the Senate Finance Committee has uh, focused on that sunset provision. 
Our concern still remains the fact that a board that has management functions rather than oversight functions themselves could be an impediment rather than an aid to better management. We think that there is a necessity for a board. We think that board ought to be a board of oversight with its sunset provision in place. And we think that it ought not to be an impediment to the proper functioning of the Internal Revenue Service. We recognize that in many respects what's there is broke, and we recognize that it has to be repaired, and in many respects not merely repaired, because that implies simply replacing a few shingles in the roof. We think maybe you have to replace the whole roof in some aspects, but we think this Board of Oversight can help do that and be in many respects a reporting board to the Congress. Um, we think that if the board were responsible for issuing annual reports or even semi-annual reports, which probably would be better, that those independent reports from an independent board would be very, very useful to the Congress in its oversight. And this committee should be very concerned about oversight and reform because this, this subcommittee is a part of that particular committee of the House. We think that the board can accomplish this. Quite frankly, we believe the board ought to be comprised only of independent sector members. We recognize that the Senate Finance Committee has focused on adding both a union representative and the Secretary of the Treasury. We think the board ought to be an independent board, and that is in our written testimony. Uh, we think you're going to have very high caliber members of the board. This is going to be something that people will look at as both a burden and as an opportunity to help the American system. And we think you'll be able to attract those people. In turn, even though the Senate Finance Committee would give a limited authority under Section 6103, which is this privacy provision, we think that that's probably not beneficial. If this truly is a private board, the ability to micromanage and to interfere and to be an impediment is something we ought not to be having. Um, we noted that you read our written testimony in advance, and we appreciate it. We noted you had a question as to the need for an undersecretary of the Treasury. Um, I would like everybody to think outside the envelope and not inside the envelope. The Treasury Department clearly has had oversight of the Internal Revenue St Service historically. Historically, it hasn't worked. Historically, the Secretary of the Treasury has many, many more burdens and many, many more responsibilities. I mean, in an international economy, fiscal responsibility both internationally and domestically, you need somebody at the Treasury who has direct oversight on behalf of the Treasury for the Internal Revenue Service. In the absence of a designated Undersecretary of the Treasury, at best that will be sporadic. At worst, that will be non-existent. No matter how often we think of it, we think reform and oversight, and oversight at the Treasury level is required here, even with the independent board, even with the many committees of Congress who have their oversight of the Internal Revenue Service. And you need a person who has that responsibility. And we strongly believe that that is a necessary responsibility. Um, we, we applaud the commissioners views on personnel. We, we strongly believe the Internal Revenue Service needs flexibility to hire the best and the brightest. And we would encourage that we think outside of that envelope as well. Civil service has its place, but it is, does have its own concerns. Um, we would come back to tax simplification. One of the problems that the Revenue Service has is responding to the many, many acts of Congress in terms of changing the Internal Revenue Code. During the 1980s, there was at least one act every year. During the 1990s, we've had major overhauls. The more complexity Congress piles on the Internal Revenue Service, the higher it is for their personnel to deal with the Internal Revenue laws and the regulations. It's very hard for us, and we're tax professionals on the AICPA level and the ABA section of taxation level to deal with all of this, both the guidance and the absence of guidance. And we would urge you to focus on the need for simplification and real simplification and what Congress in turn does to the Internal Revenue Service, which is the whipping boy for the American public. And that's a concern. Uh, thank you. I see my time is up. I'll be available to answer questions. Well, I think we'll get a lot of the points out in the discussion period. I want Mr. Marys to have a chance here. Uh, Michael Marys is chair of the uh, Tax Executive Committee of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Welcome.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, thank you for inviting the American Institute of Certified Public Accounts to testify before you today. My comments will be limited to recommendations to improve the overall management of the IRS to serve taxpayers better. Of course, on request, we will be happy to provide you with a copy of our prior written testimony and or comments that deal with other related issues. For your information, attached as Appendix A to our written testimony is a list describing our prior testimony and the most pertinent written, written comments. Because of the time constraints, I will merely summarize our key recommendations. In our opinion, the most significant management problems confronting the IRS are the need for management continuity and access to varied expertise, a change in the overall internal culture of the IRS, a customer service approach to operations, updating the agency's technology, and stability and continuity in taxation. Just as there is a need for stability and continuity in the overall governance of the IRS, we believe there is also a need for stability and continuity in its executive leadership. Accordingly, we recommend that some positions now reserved for career civil service employees be open to professional appointees who would be chosen based on their professional competence and experience. These appointees could provide the IRS with a fresh perspective and understanding of taxpayer and practitioner concerns. They would also help reduce distrust and would facilitate a better working relationship with the public and with tax practitioners. There are two specific positions we believe would best be filled by individuals with professional experience outside the IRS. Those are the taxpayer advocate and the director of practice. The IRS has been a closed organization for many years, with many of its employees having little or no professional experience outside of the service. This can lead to misunderstandings, suspicion, and a them-against-us attitude towards taxpayers. Because of factors such as inadequate training, uncompetitive salaries, and IRS bashing, many well-qualified people do not consider IRS employment or, if hired, leave the service. As hearings last fall and recent internal IRS audits have disclosed, many of those who do work for the service have been given mixed messages regarding the professional standards that apply to their jobs. As a result, there is a need to revitalize and reform the IRS at all levels. The IRS culture should foster and promote a highly competent, professional approach to tax administration with the primary goal of providing superior customer service. How do you achieve this? First, implement and maintain high educational standards that must be satisfied both to be hired and to be retained. Then provide coordinated superior training programs. Emphasize professionalism by codifying and enforcing professional standards and by devising performance measures to reward those who further the mission of the IRS. And finally, pay competitive salaries. Over the past year, there's been much demand for the IRS to provide better service to taxpayers. In response, several initiatives, such as the problem-solving days the commissioner mentioned and increased phone service have been instituted. The commissioner is also developing a proposal that would reorganize the IRS along customer lines to enable it to provide better service, more specifically designed for those particular customers or taxpayers. We support these proposals and offer our ongoing assistance for these as well as other customer service initiatives. But beyond these customer service initiatives, however, we also believe there is a need for the enactment of additional taxpayer rights provisions. And I would refer you to our written testimony at the January 29, 1998 Senate Finance Committee hearing for a discussion of the measures we believe should still be enacted. Converting the IRS into a customer-driven organization will require not only strong leadership and a change in the internal culture of the service, but also improved technology. We strongly urge you and other members of Congress to provide the IRS with the support necessary not only to modernize their technology, but to help keep it current in future years. As my colleague Mr. Tucker pointed out, the IRS can be restructured over and over again, but the basic frustration that taxpayers and tax practitioners experience with the IRS will remain until the issue of the complexity of the tax law has been adequately addressed. It is obvious to those of us here today that tax law complexity originates not from the service, 
but from Congress. That point, however, is lost over and over again on the average American. Regardless, though, of who created this complexity, the fact remains that the tax law is entirely too complex. Congress, Treasury, the Internal Revenue Service, tax practitioner groups, and the American public should all assume responsibility for simplifying and stabilizing the Internal Revenue Code. We urge Congress to apply a complexity analysis prior to passing any legislation affecting our tax laws. I have undertaken the liberty of attaching the AICPA's tax complexity index as a sample of an available analysis that could be undertaken. We also urge the IRS to provide Treasury and Congress with information regarding the administrative and taxpayer burdens that result from tax proposals as they are discussed, not merely once a year as part of the Taxpayer Advocate's annual report to Congress. Has some of these actions been undertaken, I would submit to you that the members of the AICPA, the bar, the enrolled agents, including myself, would have had a much easier time this year explaining some of the capital gains provisions to clients. I also think that the millions of notices that will probably be sent out to taxpayers who incorrectly filed their return by not realizing there were new laws and what those new laws required could have been avoided. I will be happy to answer any questions you have regarding these matters. Thank you for your attention. Well, we thank you. Uh, I know you have to grab a plane, and uh, I don't want to rush you, but some of the testimony will come out in the uh, Q&A if you can stay with us a little bit. Uh, I thought your Appendix A was immensely helpful in terms of uh, what you've done uh, as professionals with various congressional committees, so we appreciate that. Thank you. We now move to the National Academy of Public Administration, and Mr. Thomas H. Stanton is chair of the standing panel on executive organization and management of the National Academy of Public Administration, and he's accompanied by an old friend of mine named Herbert Jasper. Uh, who's been a witness many times before this subcommittee, who's also a member of the standing panel on executive organization. Now, that group, I will say uh, to anyone who cares, that uh, they probably have uh, several thousand years of high executive experience in that group, and some of them have been at it for 50 years apiece, and that ups the number to easily 1,000. <laughs> But it's a very wise group of people, even if I maybe disagree with a recommendation here and there. So, Mr. Stanton, we're glad to have you with us. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. We are absolutely delighted at your constant probing at government management issues in one area after another. And the IRS, of course, is one of the most important. In our testimony on IRS, we would like to make four major points. First. We support recommendations of the National Commission and the provisions of H.R. 2676, the IRS Restructuring Act, to strengthen congressional oversight and dedicate greater congressional attention to management issues. The National Commission focused on increasing the involvement of the congressional tax committees, but H.R. 2676 wisely includes the Government Reform and Oversight Committee in the oversight process, and we hope by extension this subcommittee. Greater involvement of your subcommittee and oversight can help to promote accountability of the IRS and to assist its managers in addressing some of the problems of an ingrown organizational culture. This subcommittee also could assist IRS in applying the Government Performance and Results Act to assure that the agency pursues performance goals that strike an appropriate balance between the need to collect revenues efficiently and the need to treat taxpayers responsibly, fairly, and with respect. And indeed, some of the problems pointed out on the Senate side can be seen as deriving from an imbalance and congressional emphasis on tax collection to the detriment of those other values. Second point, the oversight board that H.R. 2676 proposes for the IRS could gravely damage the accountability of the IRS and the quality of that agency as an institution. These problems can be overcome if the Congress were to turn the Oversight Board into an advisory board. H.R. 2676 gives the Oversight Board authority to approve strategic plans, reorganization plans, and budgets of the IRS. The bill thus allows private parties to determine the deployment of the nation's tax collection apparatus and invites self-serving actions by the private board members or invites the perception of such actions that could well lead to increased tax evasion. 
By giving the Oversight Board authority in the as important IRS decisions, H.R. 2676 will make it difficult for Congress to hold anyone accountable for IRS performance. The Commissioner, individual board members, and the Secretary of the Treasury all will be able to point to others who hold partially partial responsibility for any actions that engender criticism. We urge the Congress, as it did in legislation to create an independent Social Security Administration, instead to create an advisory board and retain a single commissioner as head of the agency who can be held fully accountable to the Congress on behalf of the American taxpayer, as happened this morning. A strong advisory board can help to infuse the IRS with fresh points of view on behalf of the private individuals and companies that must pay taxes and deal with the agency. Our third point is that management improvements must enhance rather than detract from the professionalism of the IRS. We support the ideas of a fixed term and a performance contract for the commissioner. H.R. 2676 also makes welcome additions to the flexibility of IRS personnel rules and provides that these should be exercised consistent with merit system principles. We do urge that the Congress strengthen provisions to assure that merit principles are applied to the hiring of all IRS employees below the level of commissioner. Otherwise, over time, if not immediately, the agency is likely to be offered a remarkable array of politically well-connected but marginally qualified people for positions that were intended to be filled by experts. Our fourth point, reorganizing a large and essential agency such as the IRS is a process that is fraught with pitfalls. The Congress should refrain from specifying any details of internal organization in legislation. Commissioner Rosati has proposed a far-reaching reorganization for IRS. We urge that these profound changes proceed cautiously and with sensitivity for the need to continue vital IRS functions throughout the time when reorganization is occurring. As with government efforts to absorb new technologies on a large scale, the lessons of past federal reorganizations send a signal of caution. In particular, we believe it would be unwise for the Congress to prescribe any details of a proposed reorganization. Pilot testing of new ideas may reveal that alternative approaches are needed to prevent unintended management consequences. The language of the bill, as it is evolving in the Senate, is likely to be far too rigid to permit the kind of experimentation and adaptation that is needed for large-scale reorganization to succeed. Mr. Chairman, we would like to close by pointing out, and here we are echoing uh, Representative Kucinich, that for all of the shortcomings that the Congress has identified, the IRS continues to do a remarkable job. Each year, as the Congressman pointed out, the agency processes over 200 million returns, collects over $1.5 trillion of revenues, and provides information and tax advice 100 million times. This committee needs to scrutinize the provisions of H.R. 2676, especially with respect to IRS organization and governance, to assure that new legislation does not endanger that track record. We urge that any IRS restructuring legislation include provision for prompt evaluation of the impact of particular features of the new law upon the ability of this country to continue to collect the revenues that we need. A five-year sunset provision, especially on any changes to IRS governance structure, would provide the Congress and this subcommittee in particular with an opportunity to refine its approach to these important matters in light of experience. Thank you very much. We would be pleased to answer questions. Well, uh, we thank you. Uh, what I want to do is try out some of your ideas on some of your other ideas. And we'll start with Mr. Tucker. As I remember, you uh, suggested on the behalf of your panel the Undersecretary of Taxation uh, as a possibility. As you heard me say, my worry there is that a in the hierarchy, another level is being interposed between the commissioner who knows what's going on and 102,000 employees that essentially he's responsible for managing and the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, who's the number two person, and the Secretary of the Treasury. And uh, I've seen this expansion of bureaucracy throughout cabinet departments. I've watched them since I was in a cabinet department in 1960. And we had a very small staff. Uh, commissioners did see the Secretary. 
And uh, I just think that we've got a problem here when we're interposing more people, more special assistants, more people at the staff level, and not enough worker bees. And the worker bees are in the Internal Revenue Service. And I realize that it sounds like a good idea, but I just wondered what our friends from the National Academy of Public Administration have to say about an undersecretary for taxation. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm a, I, I believe we would echo your sentiments completely. Um, this is what Paul Light has referred to as a process of thickening of government. This kind of organizational problem is very difficult to solve in the rigid language of legislation. I would also add that a lot of it would appear to be personal relationships. One member of the Academy, Sheldon Cohen, former commissioner of IRS, served at a time when there were very good relations between IRS and the Treasury. And in fact, those relations worked well because of the people involved and the mutual respect involved. There wasn't much that legislation could have added to that kind of relationship. Mr. Jasper, have any thoughts on this? Uh, yes, I guess I would uh, uh, endorse both what you've said and what Mr. Stanton has said. I think that uh, the Congress is in danger of overreacting to the quite serious problems with respect to IRS performance in numerous ways. Uh, we are going to create an oversight board. Uh, we are moving the uh, inspection service uh, substantially to the Treasury Department under the Senate bill. Uh, we are increasing congressional oversight. And now we're talking about adding yet another layer of supervision between the Secretary of the Treasury and the uh, Commissioner. I think the Congress has already gone too far, as we've said in our prepared statement, in terms of uh, overkill with respect to what's needed to reform the IRS, and the reforms are probably going to prove to be worse than the disease. Well, let me raise the uh, Inspector General issue. Should there be an Inspector General within the uh, Internal Revenue Service, or should they simply depend, as they do now, on the Inspector General of the Treasury? I think the, uh, the right answer is to retain the inspection service in the, in the Internal Revenue Service, perhaps strengthening it, perhaps redefining it. It is, in effect, their counterpart of an inspector general function. But the inspector general function, as you well know, is already controversial in the sense that it divides accountability between the head of the department and the inspector general who has his or her separate reporting channel to the Congress and the IGs have their own audit function, thus depriving the head of the agency of a valuable tool of internal management, that is audit. So I think that the IG model is not necessarily a, uh, a solution to all of our problems, but I therefore would suggest that strengthening, perhaps increasing the autonomy to some degree of the inspection service within the IRS is the better answer than moving it to the uh, Treasury Department. So you'd have the inspection service remain in the Internal Revenue Service, yes. uh, but you're not favoring an inspector general solely for IRS. You're saying let the Treasury inspector general deal with IRS as just another constituent department, even though they've got 102,000 employees? Um, my, my feeling is that the inspection service of the IRS should be strong enough to provide most of the independent inspection and audit and oversight that is required. If, in a rare case, the Inspector General of the Treasury Department needs to look at it, at the IRS, just as that Inspector General would look at some other bureau or administration of the Treasury Department, so be it. But I don't think the IG of the Treasury Department ought to have a special section just devoted to the IRS. Mr. Marys, what do you think of the idea of an undersecretary for taxation and where the inspector general ought to be? I think, first of all, that there is a lot of validity to the concern about Treasury oversight. Over the past few years, Treasury has not done as thorough or as good of a job, I think, as they could have done in supervising and in oversight over the Internal Revenue Service. I share your concerns and the concerns that I've heard here this morning about how exactly that function would operate if you have a line of communication through the IRS, through an undersecretary up to the secretary. But I think also another factor needs to be considered, and that is how this proposed position will impact the oversight board. Because with an oversight board and with perhaps an undersecretary of treasury and with 
the proposed, at least the, the House version of the bill, having the Secretary of the Treasury on the oversight board, does that bypass the need for an undersecretary? So I think you've got to look at what both what the reform proposals would be, perhaps once they're finished, to determine whether or not an undersecretary would be a good idea. But there's some validity to, to the concerns expressed for that position. Mr. Tucker, uh, as the last respondent to this question, before uh, I yield to Mr. Kucinich, why, what's your best shot in saving that idea? Uh, and as the proponent for this idea. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I, 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 Sheldon Cohn is a good friend, a former commissioner, but I would recall that he was the commissioner in a different world. At the time of the world that he was in, our real concerns abroad were the Vietnam War and whether Russia was more stable than we were in terms of enabling it to conquer the world. Today, our concerns are international fiscal policy and the international business world and the G7. And the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury has an awful lot of responsibility for that, as does the Secretary of Treasury. You need somebody who's online with the responsibility. And I fear that a Secretary of Treasury himself or herself cannot do it all. And you need somebody who reports directly that person as his or her agent and representative. And that's our position as to the undersecretary for taxation. You need somebody with real responsibility at the Treasury. We thank you. And now 10 minutes could, to Could I add just one yes. quick word? Go ahead. Uh, Perhaps the solution uh, that would meet Mr. Tucker's objectives would simply to upgrade the assistant secretary to an undersecretary and thus avoid the layering problem. Well, there, though, you're talking about the assistant secretary for tax policy, mm -hmm. which doesn't pretend, which shouldn't pretend to know a thing about human organization or anything else. They're sitting there on tax policy, aren't they? Uh, that's presumably correct. We, you know, we agree. We would keep that in place. We, we yeah. think that they are not responsible for tax administration and oughtn't to be. Mm. Policy is quite different from administration. Right. I wish you'd get a few deans of policy schools to understand that so they <laughs> teach both. My colleague from Ohio, 10 minutes for questioning. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to return to Mr. Tucker for some questions about the uh, constitutional objections which were raised in your uh, written testimony about an oversight board with governing authority over the IRS. Could you elaborate on your constitutional concerns? Uh, yes, we believe that there is, under the Constitution, the concept of separation of powers. And we believe that that separation of powers looks at the executive branch and the Internal Revenue Service and Treasury Department focus on the executive branch. And they have responsibility for the administration of the collection of taxation uh, in this country. They don't unfortunately have the full responsibility for the passage of laws that they have to administer, but they do have responsibility for administration. We think that the board, which would be a congressionally mandated board, ought not to be the party that is micromanaging and that in effect is usurping or potentially usurping those powers. We are concerned that, as, as, as Mr. Stanton has said, that this be an oversight advisory board, we think just as in Social Security Administration, you have something that clearly could work with a proper sunset and the ability to review it. But we think that this concept of the collection of our revenues and the administration of that ought to be within the executive branch. Since uh, you raise these constitutional issues, uh, could you provide this committee with any case law citations that would be instructive as to uh, why constitutionally such a provision to establish governing authority over the IRS would not pass uh, muster? We would be pleased to come back to you with, with, with citations. I think it would be helpful because uh, certainly uh, we in the legislative branch always want to be mindful about the constitutional issues and uh, your constitutional objections to forming an oversight board with governing authority is something that I think is, is noteworthy as well as uh, we certainly, uh, the idea of an advisory board is a whole different thing, I would, I would assume. Uh, how do you feel about that, Mr. Maris, again? They were, you know, do, do you see, do, do you have, do you share uh, concerns about uh, governing authority versus advisory authority? Well, I think those are legal issues, and I'd leave that to the discussion by the, by the ABA. I do think, though, that our concern about the oversight board, which is expressed in our written comments, is that this board needs to have a strategic view, not a day-to-day -day affairs view. And I think with that, we agree with, 
with our colleagues in the section of taxation. I think your I think your point is well taken because if uh, and and, they're, and it's complementary to what uh, uh, Mr. Tucker has outlined and uh, the idea of strategic planning can always be enhanced with uh, an advisory from an advisory position. But it would be counterintuitive to have an had to have a supervisory position or, in effect, governing authority, because, as you state in your testimony, you, in effect, you, you could be at cross purposes. Right. You could be creating uh, a warring camp uh, with without full constitutional authority. It, it could raise some some questions that might undermine the IRS, I would assume. And and when we heard the testimony from Mr. Rosati earlier where there is uh, an, an effort to put forth some management principles that would be part of an overall reform of the IRS. It would seem uh, uh, to, be the, um, uh, to be unwise to proceed in an area of, uh, of governing oversight until we can see if the, if the commissioner can work his plans. I mean, I, I would, I guess, my my opinion as a member of this committee would be, uh, give the commissioner an opportunity to work his plans for restructuring and reform, and if that fails, then we can look at some other uh, possible uh, remedies. Uh, but I'm, I, I want to thank the gentleman for appearing before this committee today, and I want to thank the chair for uh, calling this meeting to give the American people an opportunity to look at this uh, sometimes mysterious system of uh, income collection and, uh, and the way the IRS operates. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate being here. Well, we thank you for your very good questioning. And let's pick up one point you noted earlier. And I certainly agree with you. And that is the point that every local sheriff tax collector in America usually publishes the defaulters on the property tax in the local paper. And I guess the question I would ask of you professionals, is, do you have a problem with us going to the Ways and Means Committee and saying, look, privacy should not protect defaulters and people that are constantly defaulting and constantly going bankrupt and milking the system, not paying their employees, not putting the trust funds in Medicare, not putting the trust funds in Social Security, et cetera, et cetera. How would you feel about uh, doing just what the local sheriff does and just printing a list in the Federal Register and if the Washington Post or the San Juan Batista Mission News, no longer in existence, wants to publish it, they're free to publish it. How about it, Mr. Tucker? Well, let me note that at the local level, if a corporation is a title holder to real property, it's the name of the corporation that appears in the public record. You don't look through to what we would refer to as responsible officers, which is the focus of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, I think the problem is, as stated by the people at the GAO, that these corporations come and go. Under state law, I can have a corporation. I can dissolve or liquidate or terminate the corporation. And publishing its name really has no effect at all, because corporations are as generic as you want them to be. And my clients who are in different real estate projects, for example, have different entities for each project, because that's a creditor protection. And that is an asset protection that the creditors look at. So that's one issue. The responsible officer is something unique to the Internal Revenue Code, that, for example, if I have a state obligation to the state of Maryland for taxes from a corporation, and that corporation has gone under, that's where the obligation resides. Just as if I have a federal obligation on behalf of a corporation to the Internal Revenue Service, that's where the obligation resides. The issue is the trust fund. The responsible officer has responsibility for the trust fund. They have withheld money from an employee that's owed to the federal government and they're responsible for that as responsible officers. I will share with you that many people are thought to be responsible officers who may not be responsible officers, and that's an issue within the Internal Revenue Code. I'd have no problem with your publishing the names of all these corporations. I think, quite frankly, it could be an exercise in futility. Well, how about I think the it's the responsible officers you may want to yeah. look at, but first you have to make certain that they really are. And I think the biggest issue is the failure to pick up the returns and audit them timely. And 
too often. No, I agree with this that. This occurs, so, and I think that's yeah. the biggest problem we have. If we caught the people, and I don't mean that catching is the proper term, because you said, Mr. Kucinich, that bankruptcy is too it's, often. Uh, it, it's Kucinich. It's Kucinich. I'm sorry, Kucinich. I apologize. It, it appears on my IRS form. It's K-U-C-I-N-I-C-H, but it's Kucinich. I apologize. Um, I'm from your adjacent state, Michigan. Well, I'm from Ohio. Do you, do you, um, do you um, object to the publication of the chief executive officer of that corporation? If, in fact, that person was the responsible officer, he or she is responsible. I think the biggest issue many times is, was that person truly the responsible officer? And publishing the name of somebody who might not have been that person, I think, is an evasion of privacy. Well, if they're the chief executive and they knew that if they default and do some of the nonsense that goes on in these small corporations around the country, these aren't huge corporations, these are small corporations, restaurants, you name it, uh, nonprofit groups where I've seen them uh, not pay their proper uh, withholding to the IRS, and that hurts the obviously the individual, then it means the rest of us as taxpayers have to make that up from the general fund when they didn't right. take their 15 percent for Social Security or their 3 percent for Medicare, whatever it is. Why shouldn't the uh, uh, CEO and the treasurer or the budget officer publish all of them? Because one of the three had to be in on it or had to know. And it seems to me the public has a right to know who the defaulters are. Now. What do you think, Mr. Tucker? Uh, I, I think the comment that you made is one of the three had to be in on it may be accurate, but what about the two out of the three that weren't in on it, okay? And, and is, is publishing their names appropriate in that situation? Again, if we did the review more quickly, we did the assessment more quickly, we knew who the responsible officers were, and then we went after them, I have no problem. My problem is just blindly putting in there the ability to publish any name in any situation. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're hiding behind a corporation, I think we need to reveal those names. And just as I've said earlier, we all grew up in towns where the newspaper, and we all read them, uh, who hadn't paid their property taxes. And uh, maybe they couldn't. Maybe they had to work out something with the county tax collector. On the other hand, uh, it didn't let them get away with anything. Right now, these people can not only get away with it, they can come back in and get a loan from the Farmers Home Administration. Gotcha. And that's what I tried to stop with our Debt Collection Act, which is the law of the land, as of two years ago. And there's billions they should be collecting in that area. And that's an actual case where a guy in Sonoma County defaulted on a several million dollar loan for his ranch, moves to Santa Barbara, buys his mansion up there, also Farmers Home, and a seven-story office building. You know, it's simply unbelievable. I think we've stopped that, provided the computers talk to each other within the Department of Agriculture or between agencies so you can know when that person's applying for a government benefit. And uh, anyhow, that's uh, one issue. Does my colleague have any more questions? I, I, I would say this? I'd look forward to working with the chair on, on this uh, particular point because, uh, well, again, we, we have to respect uh, privacy concerns. The taxpayers of this country are getting ripped off for billions of dollars from people who are doing it deliberately. They're not, you know, not people who have fallen on hard times. We can, we, we grieve for those same people, but people who set out as a, as a manner of business. And corporations, under the law, as you know, are treated in most court cases as individuals. But they can, they can suddenly appear and disappear unlike individuals and then reappear again as though they were reincarnated. We mortals don't have that opportunity, but corporations do. And so when you consider that, it might be, uh, uh, this might be time, Mr. Uh, Chairman, to uh, look at uh, revision in the code. And I certainly would look forward to working with yeah. you on that and congratulate you for the work that you've done in yeah. the previous uh, uh, matters. Thank you. Uh, let me just ask one closing question. Now, I don't want to embarrass you professionals, but we have two choices that are being given us and people are going around the country trying to educate the people on the choices. One is the 17% across the board uh, approach of the majority leader, PhD in economics, Mr. Army of Texas. Another is the consumption tax, which is the approach of the distinguished chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, 
Mr. Archer, also from Texas. Now, does the uh, uh, individual who represents the, the lawyers in taxation, Mr. Tucker, wish to give us what his best shot would be on which one of those makes sense as opposed to the current system? Um, I, I'd be more than glad to. I have done uh, writing and speaking on this area. Um, we think that there is no ability to replace the Internal Revenue Code with either a consumption tax or a value-added tax of any sort. Uh, there is no civilized nation in this world that has simply a value-added tax. It's usually an adjunct to an income tax. We think our income tax system is the, with all of its deficiencies, with all of its defects, is the best in the world. We collect the great bulk of all of our money by people simply through the W-2 form or the 1099 form. We think that you can accomplish a lot more by simplifying the Internal Revenue Code, even if at some point you add to that a national sales tax or a value-added tax. Um, the other I don't hear tax. anybody talking about a value-added tax. Well, the, Maybe I'm missing something. The, 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 the consumption tax is, a, in effect, a form of value-added tax. Now, isn't the consumption tax really a sales tax? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's, it, it, and it, I would it think, has enough exceptions yeah. and enough other backouts that it, 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 is, it is a concept that's very similar to right. a national sales tax. That's, yeah. that's Which I think right. would upset the governors and the state legislatures and the local mayors, all of whom have sales taxes. Well, there would have to be an add-on. It wouldn't be a replacement, yeah. and we think that that would be very detrimental. So anyhow, that's, you're not happy about the consumption tax. Now, what about the across-the-board X percent. I think the minority leader, the Democratic leader, put in 11 percent. The majority leader put in 17. And has there any feeling on that? The studies that we have seen that we concur with show that if you were going to put across the board flat tax in, it probably is going to be in the lower to mid range of the 20s. Uh, we think a good number of the people in this country pay less than that at the present time, and that that probably is not going to be beneficial. It also requires no transition rules at all. And without transition rules, you have a massive impact on people in their present positions from real estate to manufacturing and everything else. And so we think that that would be a real problem. Mm -hmm. Mr. Marys, do you have any thoughts on this? Absolutely. About two years ago, we concluded a study on all the various alternative tax systems that were being discussed at that time. It included the flat tax, consumption tax, a value-added tax. And I'll be happy to make a copy of that study available to you because I think so, it illustrates... Without objection, it will be put in the record at this point. We, I think that that study illustrates some of the issues that Congress has to look at in dealing with any alternative system. Transition rules are a huge issue that have to be addressed. For example, in transitioning to a sales tax type of arrangement, is it fair for divorced couples who have arranged their financial affairs based upon the payment and deductibility of alimony suddenly to lose that? Is it fair for individuals who have purchased houses on the assumption they will be able to deduct the interest in real estate taxes to lose that? So there are tremendous transitional issues if you go from an income-based system to a consumption tax-based system. On the other hand, when you look at the flat tax, again, the studies that we have seen show that the rate has to be in the mid-20% range, and that raises a number of issues about who's going to be a winner and who's going to be a loser under that. Do you lose regressivity, and is that something that's desirable? So I think our position is that before we decide to change the tax system and sunsetting the Internal Revenue Code before we have a system in place would be a terrible mistake, in, in my opinion. Before we change the system, we better understand the advantages of any new system, and we better be sure we understand and can deal with the disadvantages of that new system. Well, uh, I'm going to get to you, gentlemen. Believe me, uh, I just want to say so far, on behalf there of the uh, tax uh, lawyers and the uh, tax accountants, uh, when I was on the Senate staff 38 years ago, we, I remember during the Kennedy administration, had a tax bill, and we started calling them the Lawyers and Accountants Tax Relief Act of 1962. And then you could put in 1986, you could put in what we did two years ago, because heaven knows the people had trouble with Schedule D, and uh, I've sure heard about that, and uh, that's why I said we ought to all go fill out our own tax forms, and maybe we'd make it simple. 
I've got one simple criterion on whatever they decide on in the leadership and the Committee on Ways and Means that has jurisdiction, and that is if it adds one dollar to the national deficit, I'm against it. And uh, so they're going to have to have enough money to cover uh, what we do. On the other hand, we ought to be cutting another 50 or 100 billion out of the budget of the executive branch of the government and uh, tighten up more because it can be done. It just takes some willpower. Now, what do the distinguished representatives of the National Academy of Public Administration have to say? Well, Mr. Chairman, there are going to be the same management problems yeah. for these new kinds of taxes that we have for the old. Uh, it is unlikely that Congress and the tax writing committees, in fact, will refrain from embellishing any flat tax or any value-added or sales tax with deductions. The mortgage interest deduction is already being mentioned in conjunction with the uh, flat tax. Uh, in the end, there will be tremendous administrative problems with these taxes. You don't solve anything by setting a flat tax rate, for example, in deciding whether the use of a home office is properly allocated for home or business purposes when applying that tax. There are a number of issues that are going to continue to be there and are going to continue to require somebody of the quality of Commissioner Rosati and a tremendous amount of, of hard work on the management side. Professor Jasper, any thoughts on this? Uh, just to quickly add that, uh, as you suggested earlier, if uh, members of Congress had to fill out their income taxes themselves, they would have a greater appreciation for tax simplification. I think tax simplification is what's needed not a wholesale change in the nature of our taxation. The Congress enacted the Taxpayer Relief Act last year with changes that are to be implemented over a period of, I think, as much as five or six years into the future, which means every year taxpayers are going to have to figure out what happens this year, what happens next year, and this is on top of finding that the IRS has difficulty in keeping up with the tax code as it was before the Taxpayer Relief Act. It's time to draw a line simplify the tax code, not make it more complicated, or not look for illusory alternatives. Well, I'm glad we got your statements on the record, and uh, those who read the record will uh, know where you stand. And uh, I'm not sure any of us in Congress know where we stand, but we're trying to build a consensus in this country to do either a combination of things, which is more likely, uh, because we've taken millions off the tax rolls, as you know, starting in 86. Uh, most people in lower income don't pay any taxes. Indeed, they can go in and file for the earned income tax credit, which is filled with fraud, among other things. And uh, we've got a long way to go, I think, in getting public understanding on this. But uh, Mr. Archer, Mr. Army, Mr. Tozan, uh, of, uh, of the Ways and Means Committee will certainly be uh, spreading the message around the country to get people aroused one way or the other and thinking about this. And I think that's the important thing. What's the best combination that helps us have a lean government but also pays the bills so we don't run up these unbelievable deficits which are now $5.3 trillion if I remember. So, if there's any other comments any of you would like to make, if not, I thank you all for your time and coming and sharing your thoughts with us. They're immensely helpful. With that, uh, this subcommittee is recessed till tomorrow morning.
Both the House and Senate have drafted bills to restructure the IRS. Some of the elements of the legislation include establishing new taxpayer rights, including the right to sue the IRS for damages, create a new IRS governing board, and shift the burden of proof for wrongdoing from the taxpayer to the IRS. The House passed its measure last November, and the Senate is expected to vote on its bill next month. This is C-SPAN 2, and here's what you can see this morning. Ahead, remarks from Commerce Secretary William Daly.